And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming, uh, the upcoming... RPG Stellar Chaos, straight from Infinite Monkeys Games, the one and only Jason Lamy. How you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great. How you doing? I am do I am doing good. Um, I'm seeing some people in my state complain about the cold, and I am sitting here going, "Are you fucking serious?" <laughs> it's still, it's still, it's still in the double, it's still in the double digits. Talk to me in two months, then we'll talk about cold. Yeah, we've. We've only just recently dropped below 50 degrees at night. Jeez, what? I was dropping below 50s a, f a, f a few months ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, but... normally, if we would be well into the uh, teens or, or so on a regular basis. But, mm -hmm. you know, we had to go and screw up the planet, so... Um. Well, there's al well, there's also the fact that Mother Nature is on drugs, so there's that. Well, yeah. yeah. But who gave her the drugs? Mm. But I would I'm, claim that we did, but yeah. yeah. Well, at least on the plus side, I'm not dealing with a polar vortex again. That was too much. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine that that was fun to go through. We got a little bit of that uh, a couple of years ago, and it was really nasty but we were only on the edge i can't imagine being in the middle of it i was it was 65 below Wah. yeah okay <laughs> was your was your heat able to keep up with that it was able to keep up and i t i um and nobody held it against me when i took those days off well i hope not good grief you you're not careful you're gonna freeze to your toilet <laughs> Yeah, we um this is what this is why insulation is import is important. Yeah. And there's also the, there's also the fact that no nobody want nobody wanted to drive in that kind of in that kind of weather when that when there'd be the risk of ice all over and not enough salt on the ground. Yeah, I I think at that that uh low a temperature even salt has a hard time melting through the ice anyway, so well, they were setting train tracks on fire to keep them from freezing. Yeah, I've seen that before, and that's that's interesting. But yeah, uh, that's that's when you know it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. But it's a bit of a tradition, aside from the drinking, to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. So, mm. with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh gosh. My introduction to role-playing games was way back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, when I was in grade school, and uh, I had a friend show up at lunch, um, and he brought some character sheets and some dice uh, to lunch, and introduced me to this newfangled game that was really cool called Dungeons and & Dragons. Um, and we ended up making characters over lunch and and uh you know we would get together over the on the weekends and and play um and it was cool because it was just you know this was way before video games were a big thing outside of uh arcades and you know it was a great time to be able to get together with friends and you know just pretend to be things and people that couldn't exist in the real world so mm -hmm. you know and have adventures that you know we you know we would go out and out in the woods and and play uh you know play games like you know cops and robbers or whatever mm -hmm. out there and but this was doing that but just in your mind and and it was even more fantastic so you know i had a i always had a, an overactive in imagination and so you know, this was nothing but, you know, brain candy for me. Um, and I convinced my parents to get me the uh, 
basic D and D box set at that time, um, which I actually still have. It's on my bookshelf, uh, and it's it that I, after that I was hooked. You know, every edition of D and D that came out after that, I was on top of it. Um, I went to conventions and looked at you know, other uh, game systems that had come out. Um, you know, Traveler and and um, things like uh, Space Master and Roll Master and mm-hmm. and whatnot, and just you know, it's it's been RPGs all the way down from from there on out. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I got, I just got hooked because it was the ability to be part of a grandiose adventure, no matter what the the scenario, and you know, it be something bigger than you often feel you are in the real world, and you know, just escape from the real world for a mm-hmm. while with friends and just have a fun time, you know. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of fond memories of sitting around a table, you know, for 10, 12, 14 hours with friends, you know, downing two or three two liters of Mountain Dew and several bags of Doritos, um, <laughs> you know, all while rolling dice and, and, you know, making fun of each other. So it was always a blast. And, pro- and probably making sure not to roll anybody else's dice because... Ga- because gaming is rife with superstitions. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. To touch somebody else's dice was, you know, pure blasphemy. Um, but yeah, it was, it was absolutely fun. And, you know, and all, all the super, mm-hmm. the stupid superstitions around it, uh, around playing, you know, we knew they were just dumb superstitions, but you couldn't help but do it, you know, uh, whatever your superstition was about rolling a particular die a particular way or or uh you know i had several friends who um quite literally would buy a set of dice and they would roll to find out which one of the dice in the set were the worst ones and then they would take a hammer to that die in front of the other ones to to be an example of what would happen if they rolled bad (laughs) so um yeah which like i can it's almost well. You can't you can't have dice go through Roman decimations, so I get so I guess it's a start. Um, yeah. So when so first off, since you mentioned getting started with D and D in the in in that era, um, I'll take a shot in the dark. Was it Redbox? It was. Yeah. You. Yep. I usually it's. It's usually either um, it's usually either um, Redbox or BX seems to be the starting point for a lot of people from that from that time frame. Sometimes yeah. I'll get people who started out with um some, with White Box or Moldave era. Yeah. Um, but Beckme and um what and BX seem to be the most common. Um. I'll take now since you meant since you mentioned um, experimenting with a bu- with a bunch of other games after getting in through the well for lack of a better term gateway drug that is that is D and D. Did you ha- did you end up having a natural predilection towards science fiction games because obviously something like Stellar Chaos is very far removed from doing high fantasy. It is, um, and for some reason, sci-fi has always clicked with me more than than high fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are certain books, certain movies, and such that uh, that are high fantasy that I thoroughly enjoy. But as a genre uh, on the uh, on a whole, I've always kind of gravitated more towards the sci-fi. Um, genre even though you know the two of them kind of intersect in, at a large number of points with with some of their storytelling yeah. um i think it's just the backdrop of technology which has always been um a big appeal to me you know i've always mm-hmm. been a, a a gadget geek and and computer geek so mm-hmm. you know that 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 whole genre you know the the, the whole aesthetic 
kind of appeals to me more. Um, it, it, one other thing, though, that has always kind of grated on me with the fantasy realm is so much of the fantasy realm, to me, in, in my exposure to it, has felt kind of cookie cutter ish you know you know you think about fantasy you think okay dragons elves orcs and magic you know and i can probably name half a dozen or so uh fantasy realms off the top of my head that fall into that block and aside from you know when you're talking role-playing game rules aside from specific rule sets the the universe basically has a very similar feel Mm -hmm. um and the sci-fi side of things depending on how hardcore your sci-fi is can you know revolve around a lot of things that don't necessarily include spaceships and ray guns you know uh or robots or you know any of the other typical Mm -hmm. tropes but still qualify as science fiction you know if it's that that extrapolation from scientific knowledge yeah but you know so i've always felt like the way people have treated science fiction versus the way people have treated fantasy sci-fi has explored a lot more uh territory than a lot of people who have explored fantasy have gone you know it's it's it seems like a lot of people get stuck in a very particular rut with fantasy. And so it's hard for me to continually stay in that. Now, that being said, I mean, D and D is so content rich um, with, you know, they, they took what was a very basic um, concept that if I remember correctly, was based on the Tolkien universe uh, initially, or Tol- at least inspired by a. It, w- uh, it was a hodgepodge of things from Tolkien, Moorcock, Vance, and um, Howard. Okay, I hadn't heard the others, but all right, yeah. Um, so you know, took took the inspiration from that, and they have just over the decades exploded with so much more content and you know with each iteration they've really blended things together better and better and better Mm -hmm. um so i have a hard time becoming um for lack of a better word bored in the DD world um but as far as trying to find new content uh, and new inspirations and new ideas, I tend to get more mileage out of science fiction than I do out of fantasy. I, I can I can certainly um, get that, especially since the um, we have a term here in the temple called the Tolkien melting pot for the, for that whole um, that whole phenomena of generic fantasy that you me- that you mentioned. And mm-hmm. I do think I do think the I do think the big pro- I do think the big problem is. For a lo- for a lot of people, they were only ever exposed to one style of fantasy, whereas that same generation was exposed to multiple styles of science fiction growing up. Because mm-hmm. you probably you likely grew up with Star Wars and Star Trek, like a lot like a lot of people did. And yep, even though even though those are bo- those both have elements of su- of science fiction, they don't have a whole lot in common with each other beyond that. Right. Um, and whereas when it came, whereas when it came to fantasy, that same, that same generation may have, may have started out with mostly, um, to, mostly Tolkien and may and maybe, and maybe Conan, and that's being generous. It was, the dominating factor has largely been, um, Tolkien, even though yes. there's a whole lot of variance when it comes to, um, fantasy. Um, it's like... I always find it funny when somebody tries to make a make a Tolkien comparison with with or or say that um, Lord of the Rings and Co- and Conan are in this are in the same conversation because they're both fantasy series when that's not the case at all. One of oh, them is no. high, one of them is more mythic fantasy, and the other one is um, swords and sorcery. Yes, um, I agree with you there. 
it's Conan's one of those great mm-hmm. one of those uh, great series that doesn't follow the same fantasy tropes, um, and you know it's 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 a look you know it 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 has a lot of um, fantastic things that happen in it, but it's mm-hmm. a very different feel and a very different aesthetic than you know Tolkien or whatnot. Um, yeah. And I really enjoy that about about the the Conan universe. But for a lot for a lot of people, um, that that sort of that's that sort of very British um, high slash mythic style is is seen, is seen as the default. Mm-hmm. And the the I don't and on paper I don't have a problem with it being the default. I have a problem with it being a that there is one default, whereas that same generation. Growing up with um, Star Wars and Star Trek, and maybe um, and maybe B five in my case, um, there's multiple potential defaults. But yeah, I will I will agree with that. I and I and I think you really hit some great uh, examples um, and put things in a way that that I've been struggling with for years on trying to to explain. Mm-hmm. Um, because most people that I've spoken to about this, they're like, well, every time I think of you know, of sci-fi, it's all ray guns and spaceships. And it's like, yeah, not not so much. I mean, yeah, I, I grew up, you know, my my influential years were the late 70s through the 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I had like Buck Rogers and, um, you know, Star Wars, the original Star Trek. um, Battlestar Galactica, you know, and mm-hmm. yeah, the commonalities. Okay, they all have spaceships. Okay, great, but there are very, very different stories that handle things in very different ways. Um, I'd and... say I'd say by the late seventies, the whole ra- the whole um, the whole ray the whole ray gun thing was starting to fall out of was starting to fall out of favor. Honestly, yeah, I'll, I I agree with that. Um, but you know, you even but some of the, one of the neat things that happened with um, science fiction is it it accidentally came into uh, um, becoming part of other series that never would have been science fiction. You know, for example, if you take uh, like the cartoon GI Joe, mm-hmm. everybody had laser guns, and the reason why they had laser guns was to get around the censors who said. You can't have people getting shot with, you know, actual rifles or things like that. So they went with a proxy of something that doesn't exist. Therefore, they couldn't get censored for it. Um, And, you know, at least partially dragged that whole series into the sci-fi realm by the fact that they're using laser guns Mm -hmm. and some technology that doesn't exist uh, to get around some of these censorship things. Yeah. Um now when it now obviously whenever I whenever I've um done discussions about genre, I always try and de- I always try and describe th- things as more of a Venn diagram. In fact, th- somebody um I re- I remember I remember somebody making this three-tiered Venn di- Venn diagram between um I think it I th- um fa- one side, one side was, I think, one side was, fa- one side was, fantasy. One side was sci-fi. I can't remember what the third one was. And they, and they showed where they showed what sort of examples you get when they intersect with each other. Mm-hmm. Which, and even even if I'm just using science fiction, of course, there's going to be a whole lot of variance. When it, given that, would you, would it be fair to say? Would it be fair to say that Stellar Chaos leans a little bit into the harder side of science fiction? Not full on hard SF, but a little but like sixty forty towards the hard end of things. Yeah, I would I would say definitely Stellar Chaos leans into the harder science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um with this particular game, uh I tried very hard to try to keep things grounded grounded in actual science in in actual speculative science based on real and current um 
theories and hypotheses mm -hmm. uh, and actual technology that we have and try to imagine that progression going out as opposed to, um, you know, just coming up with deus ex machina tech that could make whatever I wanted happen happen. Um, there are a couple of elements that step away from the hard sci-fi. Um, and some of that, I have to admit, was uh, just to add a little extra flavor to the game. Um, to give to appeal to a wider audience. Um, and one of those things is there's, there's one particular um, race of characters who have psychic ability. And... Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know there's a lot of a lot of people who feel that psychic ability I exists and you know is is proven and whatnot, but the science side of things says that there's no evidence for it. Yeah. So, um, you know, so whether or not it's a real thing, it's, that that's up to people's interpretation. But the, there's not the scientific evidence and methodology to to measure it and observe it and such yeah um so to try to speculate that out as a thing doesn't doesn't fall into the harder side of sci-fi but it's in the game uh and it it adds a bit of a fantastic element to it um you know so it's it falls a little bit into the realm of science fantasy but um you know the vast majority of of the game is very much steeped in in hard sci-fi mm -hmm. uh you know newtonian physics things of that nature yeah. and even with i will admit that my own philosophy on on the matter of realism is more of um is more of the fact that i prefer believability over realism um i have I, or i've said to put it another way i've cited i've cited um though that catchphrase for the first Superman film as a as Kind of a emblem, kind of an emblematic statement of what of what I shoot for. The whole "you will believe that a man can fly," right? Um, but when it when it comes to stellar chaos, one of the things that really struck me was the fact that you're using a rollover D one D one hundred system, and mm -hmm. a lot of times when I see when I see D one hundred or percentile die, um. Nine times out of ten, it's roll under, um, especially with especially with the popularity of the basic role playing lines from Chaosium. Um, okay. The only the and since you mentioned Space Master, I was curious if that was if that was one of your major influences when it came to doing that Space Master and just the Roll Master system as a whole to do that um, roll high D one hundred approach. Um, honestly, uh, Space Master was an influence in terms of more, um, content influence and, uh, you know, the idea of being a little bit harder sci-fi than, than science fantasy. But as far as the system influence goes, not really. Um, the game systems act actually been through about four different iterations uh and um we've done a lot of play testing with it so it's the way that we got to the system we have now is kind of a long and windy road mm -hmm. um in terms of you know finding the problem areas and and smoothing it out and trying to streamline it some um it used to be not quite so uh straightforward as it was as it is now um and just the the roll you know the d the the percentile roll over uh your target um system just kind of evolved uh it was not the aim at the very beginning which i can i can um so i can certainly get Get around that kind that kind of thing. When it came to when it came to those iterations, was it a case of um, just the ver just the previous versions were kind of play were kind of play tested out? Um. Yeah. 
they were uh and you know during each place uh, play test um campaign you know i would make notes of where there was a lot of either confusion or um there was you know it, well the, the process of doing x is taking way too much time this needs to be simplified you know those kinds of of changes so yeah i mean we we played them out a lot and um so yeah it's it's it has come a very long way and a lot of the the sticky points of the system have been sanded down and smoothed out yeah and what i do find what i do find interesting is as well is the fact that a lot of time I'd say the I'd say about ninety nine percent of non OSR ish games that you're that you're gonna see these days have a unified mechanic, i.e. The, i.e. this one particular style of die rolling that all roads lead to. Um, I like I like to call it the, I like to call it the Ro- the Roman philosophy. You know, all roads lead to Rome. Um, right. But in your case, you have two major ones that you that you're doing, the roll high D100 for most rolls, and for attribute rolls, a low a um, roll low uh, 2D6. Um, right. Was it a, was it a case where you where you weren't able to find you weren't able to find a, a reason to use the D100 approach when it came to the when it came to attribute rolls? Honestly, um, when it came to the attribute roles, um, we started out with um, a 3D6 system, mm-hmm. and um, the 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 attributes we didn't want to be this huge number range. Um, you know, when you're talking about a character's skills, you know that that's a very broad spectrum that a character could be along you know with a skill of how well they can use that skill mm-hmm. but an attribute um you know when you're talking about physical and mental attributes of a character for most people you can generally fit them into you know a, a very small range of yeah this person physically i would describe would be in you know this box and this person this other person would fit in this other box as far as you know uh, you know strength or height or build or or you know speed or or whatnot and when we took a look at it it there were that it's it's not a very broad range so it didn't make sense to have you know um a score that could be you know anywhere between one and a hundred Mm -hmm. Um, even if we broke that up into ranges, you know, like if you're between 90 and a hundred, you know, this is your set of, you know, then what's the use of having the other nine numbers in between the 90 and the hundred. Um, so we kept it, uh, small on purpose just to keep it, you know, a little easier to, to, to manage and, um, keep it reasonably, there's a lot of other games that use very low numbers for attributes, and it was mm-hmm. one of those that were like, eh, it works for so many systems. Why rock the boat too much and and make people have to reconceptualize how to interpret attributes for their characters? Um, so, you know, we stuck with the low numbers for that. Um, as far as uh, roles go for an attribute role, those have actually changed from the the... the so the material you have that I sent you mm-hmm. um, is the light system, uh, which is very streamlined, very, very, um, uh, very um, minimized uh, version of the full system. Um, and the way in the full system that attributes roll is your attribute determines a modifier that you get and you roll against um you end up rolling uh, not so much under your your um, attribute score, but you end up rolling over a uh, uh, a target number that the GM determines mm-hmm. using 
again the percentile dice so it's we've a lot of the the streamlining for the full version has been as you were saying going with the roman philosophy of let's try to you know keep all of our roles fairly similar so that you know you, you're not having to do the whole you know the old a d and d thing of okay what combination of dice does this thing need this time um because the the game when it was first developed uh very much was plagued with that problem everything had its own uh way of handling a role and it was confusing as hell so yeah over the iterations including with with attributes other than uh the attribute score itself things have been leading back to a a, a d100 role which I, I can i can certainly uh, go along with and when it can... The other thing that I did no that I did notice is it seems that a lot that a lot of the game is is built around the uh, skill system. Yes. Um now take and with that with that in mind would it be fair would it be fair to say that skill allocation is it, uh, is going to be the most important part when it comes to character creation and character advancement? Yes. That is that is a very fair thing to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the philosophies that we went for is, um, A, we didn't want to have characters tied to a particular level. Um, you know, because we're kind of taking a realism uh, perspective on things, um, you know, you, you pick any random person off the street and they're going to have skills that they are excellent at and skills that they are not excellent at. And those are the things that are going to determine that person's success at a particular task. Um, so skill allocation and skill choices for a character uh, can it, it can make or break that character in, an, in a, a given scenario. Um, so instead of advancing a character's level or such, um, Characters periodically gain um, an allotment of skill points uh, every experience milestone, um, and those they use to either acquire new skills or advance the skills they already have. Um, but you know, so yeah, it's, it's it, character development, uh, character creation is mostly about the skills. Yeah, and. With that, with that, given that emphasis on on skills, is is the skill part of character creation going to be an an exercise in point spending, or is it going is it going to be rooted in someone's choice of careers? Uh, primarily, it's rooted. Um, so it's it's a combination of both, to be honest. Um, your the the career that you pick for your character provides that character with a um an allotment of skills at a preset um level a uh, preset tier for that for that character uh, for that occupation um your character's attributes will determine um any additional skill points they get at creation that they can add additional skills that they might want to their character um so it's it's kind of a a a, a a compromise between your career determines what your character knows and your uh, you have points to spend. Um, in addition, we actually included uh, rules for having a character uh, change a career. Mm -hmm. um, and in that kind of an instance, you know, they don't lose the skills they already know, but they lose the... Um, advantages of that occupation uh but they gain the advantages of the new occupation so and depending on the occupation that could be you know discounts for certain kind of equipment or they have access to certain types of contacts who can you know provide information data you know networking whatever um or you know it might reduce the cost for certain types of skill advancement um and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, 
each occupation has advantages and disadvantages um, uh, depending on what you're trying to do with your character. So, but the the thing that that we wanted is, you know, I can, you know, as as t take a, you know, again, a random person off the street. And this is this is the extra the thought exercise we went through a lot. Mm -hmm. So if you took random guy off the street and, you know, if you only went by the first job he ever had, you know, most of us probably wouldn't be out of the retail world. Um, but, you know, we can change career at any time. So why can't a character change their career at any time and you know again be able to have access to new types of skills uh new training new uh um perks and uh access to things they wouldn't have had otherwise so you know we 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 built that into it so that occupations were more than just a a title um and you know a, a grouping of skills all right and given that given that given that approach is it a, is is it a case where when somebody pick when somebody picks a career that the, that um like at character creation would it would it be an instance of okay if you're picking this this career then you then when it comes to spent when it comes to um getting ranks in um skills you have, you can pick from this pool or is it a more path based approach um, it's actually, uh, the, 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 um, pool approach, your, uh, occupation determines what skill categories are the most available to you mm -hmm. and skill, skill acquire, acquiring skills or advancing skills for skills outside of those, uh, categories are more expensive in terms of skills point skill point spending um so you know it doesn't lock you out of any skill choice out there it just it's more expensive and, and harder to advance or gain skills outside of your occupation's influence um but yeah i mean it like like in life, you know, you can learn skills for anything you want to learn if you put yourself to it. Um, it's the same way in the game. Um, you can be as specialized if you want your character to be or as jack of all trades as you want to be. Um, you know, but, you know, the same, same advantages and disadvantages of those two uh, career choices apply in game. You know, if you, if you specialize, then you are going to be awesome at this one particular skill set um but are going to be needing you know friends who can do the other things for you and mm -hmm. if you're a jack of all trades you can put your fingers in every pot but you're not going to be the greatest at anything um yeah. and so now when it comes to combat one of the, one of the things that i noticed in the material that that you sent me mm -hmm. were the was the layered approach when it came to attack and defense Yes. I either, I either there's mul there's mul there's a multiple for lack of a better term chances that I'll use. And taking that taking that into account as well as the relationship between damage and damage potential and the relationship between um between its between its equivalent with say armor. Mm -hmm. Um I e I um eight armor HP damage resistance and um and so on. Would it be fair to say that encounters lean more on the lethal end of things, where the where the wrong move or the disfavor of the dice gods can cause a lot of damage? Yes, that is a brilliant interpretation. Um, uh, the the elevator pitch I generally give is that the combat system is not forgiving. Um, uh, you know, it, it basically, my, my other way of phrasing it is, um, you know, there's the old RPG adage of splitting the party means death for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and this game system wholeheartedly and eagerly takes advantage of that. Um, so, you know, 
make stupid choices, win stupid prizes, basically. Um, so yeah, it's it's the damage the the combat system delivers um, what what we determine to be kind of realistic levels of injury. Um, but then we try to offset that with uh, character equipment such as armor or shield or or you know other things like cover and such, which mm -hmm. will heavily protect you from that damage. Um, and then again, um, in the way that damage being dealt, you know, being hit by a shot is not the same as being damaged by a shot. Um, if you have the right armor or shield, you know, if my, if I have a little pea shooter and you're in a tank, I can shoot you all day long and I'm not going to hurt you, mm -hmm. you know, whereas, you know, if I've got, you know, body armor on, you know, riot gear and you've got a Barrett 50, my riot gear is not going to mean much. Um, so, you know, it goes both ways. Um, so yeah, there's the initial role of, do I hit the target? And then after that, there's a comparison of my damage potential versus the damage resistance of the target. And if their damage resistance is higher, then, you know, yeah, I hit them, but they aren't taking any damage from it. Um, and then again, even if I do happen to have a higher damage potential, their armor, their shields are going to um, absorb some of that and reduce what the character themselves take. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the combat system, while very unforgiving, um, is a, has the allowance for um, characters to be able to survive it, provided the players don't decide to try to be, you know, an action hero and and run off on their own um and do you know wild and crazy things i think i think there's ways for people to do for people to do an action hero thing in this game but i think but it's one of those cases where you have to um approach it by its rules you're not you're not going to be going rambo in the in this thing you've you've i'd say as cliche as it may sound, you've got you've got to be shooting more for for um, Agent Forty Seven than than Rambo. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a that's a brilliant way of putting it. Um, now, I, that being said, uh, in the most recent game that we ran of it, um, mm -hmm. I did have a player who um, got a little theatrical with an attack, and they burst into a room and surprised a couple of guards uh, who were behind the desk. And his initiative role was really good. He was the first one out. And the best thing he could do, he had his he had removed his armored helmet and was holding it in one hand. And he made his movement where he ran forward, jumped up on the desk, and smacked the guard in the head with his armored helmet. Um and you know it was it was something that cinematically would have been a fantastic action hero move mm -hmm. um and was not something that i was expecting them to do at all but you know it, it, it like you said it, it was it was a you know fantastic action move but done within the game's rules not not um not so much you know, uh, playing it fast and loose, you know, it, it's, but, you know, it, it, it worked and it, by all the dice rolls and everything, that guard was out and it was, it was a great move and we were laughing about it for, mm -hmm. I can't count how long, but <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. But I mean, yeah, there is, there is room for that kind of play in the game. It's just, you know, yeah, if somebody decides they're, more Rambo and less Agent Forty Seven. They're they're going to have a very hard time. Mm -hmm. Um. What and when it comes, that's that's the reason why I used um I used Agent Forty Seven from Hitman as my example, and I could have gone with John Wick as well. But the the point is is that yeah. 
it's not that you can, it's not that you can't do it it's it's that you um you have to take the you have to take the right approach with with um how it's going to work right um and i'm in that in that with that in mind what what was the story behind introducing damage potential because i get the feeling that was something that was added in to control something that wasn't taken that wasn't accounted for in an earlier um, version. Uh, you got some really good insight on that. Um, <laughs> damage potential came in fairly early in the development process, but it was after the first version of the rule were written. Um, uh, we had already, you know, we, we knew we had a, a very unforgiving combat system, and we had tried to account for that with just pure armor. Um, and armor was just a, at the time, um, all armor did was absorb damage based on what kind of armor you had. Um, but we found very quickly, even then, uh, it, we either had a situation where the armor just did not help enough or players could game the the system where armor just didn't matter at all you know mm -hmm. it, by choosing the kinds of of weaponry that they had and were always walking around with and things of that nature you know it very quickly became a matter of you know i don't care if you're wearing heavy armor with uh, with 50 hit points you know give me a round or two and that armor is just not going to matter anymore um so in Believe it or not, um, in watching some, what movie was it? It was actually Saving Private Ryan, um, I think it was, that really kicked off in my head. There's a scene near the end of the movie where Tom Hanks' character is, I think it was Tom Hanks' character, was lying on the ground. He's injured and he's got a tank that's approaching him. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's just... He's pulled out a sidearm and he's, you know, not giving up. He's just shooting it at the tank. Mm -hmm. You know, it made me think, you know, yeah, you can shoot that gun at it all day long and it's not going to do anything. And then I thought, you know, well, that shouldn't that be the same way as as body armor, especially powered body armor? You know, if you don't have the right kind of, of weaponry, then, you know, if you have your typical civilian carried sidearm, that's not going to do much to punch through armor. Um, whereas, you know, if you're somebody who runs around with high power weaponry or is a sniper or whatnot, you know, you're going to have equipment that's designed more for defeating that kind of, of defense. So, um, we started looking into giving, uh, the ability for armor to, withstand up to a certain amount of of da of uh, abuse before taking damage um and that led to you know weaponry getting uh damage potential uh ratings and armor getting its uh, damage resistance ratings um and that went through a number of different iterations as well mm -hmm. uh we started out pretty broadly with with different armors just being in a specific class you know you know class three armor can withstand up to x amount of of damage and you know it doing that meant either we had to come up with a ton of different types of armor in the core rule book or everything's going to be too darn similar to each other so why pick x over y um and then that broke down to it's a and then just an individual rating to, you know, specific, you know, this armor um, has is, to is specifically has this uh, uh, damage resistance, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that gave rise to some of the other uh, attributes of armor, such as how it affects your movement, how it affects um, stealth capability, things of that nature. So that's that becomes kind of your your comparison point from suit of armor X to suit of armor Y. They might have similar damage resistance, but 
you know, how does this affect my movement? How does this affect this, uh, my, my ability to, you know, stay quiet, be undetected, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it, 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 uh, yeah, it was, a uh, born out of the fact that just people can, could game away the, the, the impact of armor. And now it's a lot more, um, both reassuring to the player and, um, can be intimidating to the player when they come across something that has a very high damage <laughs> value. Um, because at that point, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot you can do against it. Um, in many cases when you're, when you're up against something that's got a, a very high damage resistance. Um, yeah. so at that point, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you run away? Do you try to find some other way of taking something out? You know, um, and it also, it, it, you know, damage resistance also gave us uh, a way of giving ratings to things that were not necessarily a target or a, um, a piece of armor. Um, you know, say you want to, you know, you want to uh, try to kick in a door. Well, what's the door made of? Well, what's its damage resistance? You know, some doors are flimsy as heck. Some doors are, you know, heavily reinforced. And this gave us a very easy way of being able to assign that to things, and especially in game scenarios and, and modules. Um, you know, so, you know, character A might go, okay, well, I'll pull out my pistol and shoot the, the doorknob off this door. And it's like, mm, yeah, your pistol does not, it just ricochets off, you know. Um, so it's it it allowed us to create more challenge areas for uh, for players as well. So it's it's been a, a great addition to the game. Yeah, and when it comes, given the, I, the other thing I could see ha I could see happening is the phenomena of chip damage of the yes. of the whole thing the whole thing of hey, if I if I shoot if I shoot enough bullets event eventually it'll die or the or the in, i.e. the infamous um, cyber demon pro tip, you know, to defeat the cyber demon, shoot at it until it dies. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But with the with that kind of thing in mind, and and encouraging the idea of of utilizing multiple types of weaponry, there's two aspects of combat that I'm curious if the non light version will be addressing. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is. The nature of automatic fire, i.e., is i.e. could somebody theoretically go go on go on um Overwatch with with um with 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 say the heavy weaponry, and the other thing that I'm curious about is the notion of um of cold shots. So, cold shots specifically does exist in mm -hmm. the game. Um. And it is a it's it's fairly simple in you know uh, implementation. It adds a difficulty modifier depending on you know distance, visibility, you know things of that nature. It adds a difficulty modifier to to do a called shot. Um, but um, but again, that was one of those things that we tried really hard to not overcomplicate. Um, because the first, when we first started braining, brainstorming it, um, I started looking into all kinds of things. Like my father-in-law is a, is a, uh, national champion shooter for competitions. And I've been to the range with him a number of times. So we, you know, I've played with the notion of, you know, what are all the things that can affect a shot when you want to place it at a specific point at a spe you know specific range and very quickly made it very very complicated um for a game system and and mm -hmm. had to reel that back in um so now it's it's a a gm's discretion call in terms of of uh difficulty based on range visibility um and uh of course character movement things of that nature um so there's some guidelines there for called shot but it's it's very much just a single modifier 
Um, the idea of Overwatch uh, is not a specific rule in the game, but there are rules in the full system that can facilitate it. Um, for example, a character can choose to hold their action um, for a later point in uh, the initiative, um, the, the, the initiative uh, order. So that they can say, I want to wait until so, so-and-so pokes their head out and I'm going to be sitting here ready to fire at them the moment they poke their head out. Um, you know, so they have defined a a trigger. They've defined a uh, or a situation in which they will act. So the moment that that happens, they get to take their go. Mm -hmm. The downside to doing that means that they have, for the rest of combat, shifted their reaction to that point in the initiative stack. Um, so, you know, holding holding one's action has positives and negatives to it but it allows people to do things like say do overwatch mm -hmm. um there are other aspects of the game that can improve that uh you know some some of the skills out there for the characters would allow a character to gain uh advantage um during you know say they want to use an overwatch uh, set themselves up for an overwatch type situation there are certain skills around ambushing or uh, sniping or um, uh, using combat intuition to be able to augment uh, their action when it does take place so you know they the 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 shifting of a of initiative order might be worth um, might be worth it because you have the skill behind your character to make a play like that really work for you. So, you know, th again, it becomes a, a very skill oriented decision. Uh, but it's, it's, it's in there. The, the scaffolding is in there for a character to use the rules for such a situation. Mm-hmm. Um, another, given, given all that, um, would it be also fair to say that combat is likely to favor ranged weaponry over, um, melee? Uh, I would say that's not quite true. Um, in all likelihood, um, the majority of combat will be ranged weaponry. But there are a number of skills and a ton of equipment that are all based on melee combat. Um, and we have had a number of times in game where um, a character or two have been able to overrun a, an NPC's position and totally take advantage of the fact that they are right in that that character's face mm -hmm. and so the character could not react with a ranged weapon um and because the the player character was using melee weapons and melee skills they just absolutely decimated the the npc um who did not have much in the way of of defense at that point um you know, thinking in terms of modern times, you know, a, whether you, if you're if you're running into a more, uh, I'm going to use the word organized uh, combat situation, um, ranged weapons are probably what you're going to run into. Uh, if you are, say, skulking around in the shadows or whatnot, then melee weapons are probably going to be what you go for. Um, but it's not a guarantee that, that melee is, is the favored side of things. The rules don't, don't lean more towards me more towards ranged versus melee. Um, both are equally unforgiving, um, and, uh, both can, you know, take a character down very quickly, but, um, you know, just just in the nature of the 
um, environment of the game, mm -hmm. ranged is what you tend to run into more often. And taking with within that now, because of the fact that you are doing a a, a SF game that that's going to involve a whole lot of um, space, um, will the full rules be? be addressing the matter of ship-to-ship -ship combat. Yes, indeed. Yeah. We have um, a set of ship-to-ship -ship combat rules. Uh, they are based in Newtonian physics. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the direction your ship is pointing and the direction your ship is moving are not necessarily the same. Um, and we've even taken into account... Um, relative speeds so some types of ships can go um you know some significant fraction of the speed of light and uh but you know sensor readings and whatnot only move at the speed of light no faster so you come into a system and it takes 20 hours for your sensor sweep of the system to go across this across the to to look across the system to see if there's any ships out there what comes back is going to be 40 hours old at the the furthest extent of your sensor range you know for the signal to go out and come back and so it, with that taken into account um a lot of uh ship to ship before ships come into contact with each other for close range closer range combat um there's a lot of uh rule structure around what does that look like um, from a ship's perspective to be able to try to track and maneuver another ship uh, until you're within a, a certain range where, you know, your your visual ability to, your ability to know where it is is pretty much real time. Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you're watching things that happened hours and hours ago and trying your best guess at where to be. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to ship to ship combat, um, it comes in two flavors. Um, it's relativistic combat or real time combat. And at relativistic combat, you've got two ships that are both moving at relativistic speeds, trying to, um, uh, conduct combat with one another. And at that point, um, from a player's perspective, their skills come in to um, how well they've tracked the ship and how well um, they are uh, influencing the computer's systems for attacking the ship. But the actual attacks take place by the ship's computers, so um, it's, it's about it's more about ship operations rather than manual targeting and firing when it's in real time combat um, or relative uh, real time. Yeah. Real time combat. Excuse me. Um, then it's about characters, ship weapons, capabilities to aim and, and fire at the other ships. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, again, it's a, it's a, a level of trying to deal with, what would realistically be? What would it realistically be like, um, speculatively going forward? But also, you know, um, giving care, giving characters and GMs multiple layers to play at uh, with that. So, yeah, it, I mean, but yes, the, the short answer: yes, there are mm -hmm. rules for ship to ship combat. <laughs> I know I'm rambling. I'm sorry. No, wor no worries. Like, like I said, this it this is that kind of show. Um, that brings that does bring me to the matter of um of psychics, since that was one of the things that you mentioned as that leans a little bit in the fantastical, but you want but you wanted to put it in. And mm -hmm. to be fair, to be fair with with its. There's a there's a long relationship with of mental powers within science fiction going all the way back to Asimov's work with like with books like I Robot, The Robots of Dawn and Foundation. Right. Um and 
what I'm curious about, because I did see these psych points in the um, character sheets, but what I'm curious about is, is the use of psychic powers um, a, a set of skills in and of themselves, or is it a little bit more divorced from the rest of the system? They started out divorced from it, but have ended up becoming part of the skill system. Um, they're rolled very much in the same way as the skill system. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and they are developed similarly to uh, a character's skills would be uh, in terms of improving one's ability to use a particular psychic ability. Um, but the ability to use them is... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's handicapped by your the number of psychic points that your character has to use with them. Um, and the some abilities are more powerful than others, and as they go up in power, they require a larger, you know, allotment of points to use. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure it's a very familiar trope for that kind of ability across uh, role-playing games. Um, but... I think the, where Stellar Chaos differs a little bit is um, because they're treated as skills, um, they can have an opposed role to them uh, from a defending character if that defending character is aware um, or is aware that somebody's trying to use an ability against them or if it's the kind of ability that there's no way they would be unaware mm -hmm. that it happened you know if if i'm if i'm trying to use um an ability to influence your actions you're going to notice that suddenly you have this urge to go do something or your your body is moving and it seems like it's moving without your your thought or or intention you know at that at those kinds of with those kinds of things you know you're you're likely to start thinking, you know, oh crap, somebody's trying to to control me, and you'd have an opposed role to negate that ability. Mm -hmm. um, other other psychic abilities um, are there's a role, there's an opposed role to them, but it's not an intentional po opposed role. It's one of, you know, okay, if the opposed role wins out, then the target character may not notice specifically what was going on, but there's some after effect. You know, maybe they feel feel dizzy or maybe they, you know, something doesn't seem right or, you know, there's there's something there that feels off, but they can't necessarily put their finger on what exactly it is kind of thing. All right. Um, but you know, as a character, develop those uh, those psychic skills. Um, the opposed roles become uh, less and less of an obstacle, um, and it becomes more of you know, unless the person you're trying to influence in some way is also a psychic, uh, chances are you're going to be able to, you know. Um, manipulate people or dig into their brains some or you know maybe you know if you're using um psychokinesis you know move things larger things uh heavier things um or move them more accurately uh that kind of thing mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean your, your your point pool is just there as far as you know what's the degree of stamina do you have for using these ability in in a particular chunk of time um and um you know so there there was at one point some pretty severe consequences for running through all of your your psychic points rather rapidly mm -hmm. um such as a character completely losing consciousness for days on end uh but 
we found in in playtesting that that was a little bit too harsh um and characters in desperate situations would end up you know in very very worse situations running through their psychic points like that uh just trying to defend themselves so you know we've eased back on on some of the the downsides of using the psychic points but um the but um yeah it, it basically all falls to just improving those those psychic skills that they have all right i can definitely get i can definitely get that now give now um, i know that you and I, I know that there was the whole thing with the light version but as far as the full-sized version of stellar chaos what are you shooting for as far as a um, book size in terms of page count currently we're at about 300 pages um and that's that's pretty much what it's going to max out at um and i say we're almost there because um we are revamping a couple of of sections of the manual right now um to clean up some some areas uh, i've got a couple of writers that i recently hired who are helping to fill out some additional source material to go into uh some of the history chapter um so uh but, but ultimately we're going to max out at about 300 no more pages all right and what would you what what do you have in mind as far as a not a release date per se but a general window um the window i'm looking at is by spring of next year all right I, and um i'm get and i'm guess i'm given the fact that there were a few elements of um bookmarks and um and hyperlinks within the PDF that I saw. I'm guessing that's also going to be a thing in the PDF version of um, Stellar Chaos as a whole. Yes, which I wholeheartedly approve of because one of the things that I've been really I've been really big on since I start since I started doing this whole channel was navigation. Um, largely because I've seen what happens when people do it wrong. Case in point, rifts. <laughs> <laughs> oh god yeah but it's definitely something that i'll be looking forward to once it once it comes around i'm pretty sure there's going to be there's going to be some for some further updates um throughout oh yeah absolutely and one of the things that we're actually working on um is uh because we're we're working through well i shouldn't say through we are uh, um, one of the places we're selling uh, Stellar Chaos stuff is through Drive Through RPG, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that they put out in the last year was a guide for improving PDFs for mobile use. So we've taken that to heart, um, and one of the things that we're going to be doing soon, um, once the the manual is finalized, is reformatting it to uh a having a separate standalone version of the the manual that is mobile friendly um so navigation in that aspect is going to be absolute key um to being able to to make that happen but it also means you know completely changing the way the table of contents is laid out can uh, changing you know what kind of navigation bars you have at the at the top and bottom of each page and you know m reducing the number of images in the book things of that nature um so it's not going to be an insignificant amount of work but it is something that we feel is um going to be absolutely key uh because you know everybody's moving to using their mobiles for everything mobile devices mm -hmm. and one of the other things that we're doing um is we're going to be making a version of the manual available that makes use of dyslexic friendly uh font faces um so 
if we have any anybody who's interested in the game who does suffer from from dyslexia there will be uh, options for them to be able to get a version that uses the the fonts that help mitigate that and not i um like i can def i definitely i can definitely approve of that um but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play. Ah, my and, pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for having me. This was great fun. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!